Well, evening, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to you. Good to see you tonight as we meet together once again uh, to worship God. Just a, a few things to mention as we get underway this evening. Um, we're going to be in the book of Genesis once again. We've been going through uh, the first two chapters uh, of the book of Genesis in recent weeks, and we're looking at the second half of chapter two uh, this evening. Uh, then, uh, after the service tonight, if those who are involved in the Holiday Bible Club could please stay around uh, just for a brief time of prayer and also for any um, last-minute planning that needs to be done ahead of uh, tomorrow evening as the, the Holiday Bible Club gets underway. Uh, Holiday Bible Club is each evening this week, 6 o'clock um, each evening, uh, and so that means there's going to be no uh, regular prayer meeting as they would normally be at half past seven on Wednesday. Instead, there'll be a, a time of prayer at the end of each of the, the Holiday Bible Club nights um, as we, we draw the, the evening to a close and the kids head home. Then next Sunday, um, it's me both morning and evening. We'll be in the book of Isaiah in the morning and in the book of Genesis uh, once again in uh, the evening. Well, as I said, uh, tonight we're going to be in, in Genesis and we're going to be looking at the passage where marriage is uh, instituted there in the Garden of Eden. And of course, the, the Bible begins with a marriage in Genesis uh, chapter 2. And the Bible ends with a marriage uh, as well. The first marriage points to the last marriage, the marriage of, of Christ uh, and his church. And I want to begin our service this evening by reading some verses, therefore, from towards the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 19, and uh, these verses which describe that, that glorious wedding scene uh, that we meet with uh, at the end of the story of the Bible. John writes, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Tonight we gather here to worship God uh, together and to praise him for this, this great marriage that we are moving towards, the marriage of, of Christ with his bride, the church. And our first item of praise is this wonderful psalm. It's Psalm 45, if you could turn there or follow on the screen. And it's a, a psalm that would have been used uh, in Old Testament days to describe the, uh, the wedding of the king, a royal wedding. Uh, as the king uh, met his bride. And of course, it, it points us forward again uh, to what the story of the Bible is all moving towards when the, the king um, is going to be presented with his bride at the end, the bride who will be spotless and perfect on that day. So we'll sing the opening few verses of this uh, psalm, Psalm 45, uh, verses 1 through 6. A noble theme inspires my heart with verses for the king, my tongue's a skillful writer's pen, composing lines to sing. Psalm 45, verses 1 to 6, we'll stand and sing together. Take up your soul and bind it. 
be seated and we'll turn to God now in prayer let's pray together (coughs) father we do thank you for the the chance this evening we have to meet together as your people to bring our praises to you (coughs) and we thank you for those words of Psalm 45 that we've been able to sing to you this evening as we join together and as we say before you that a noble theme inspires our hearts with verses for the king father we praise you for the king who is your son jesus and as this psalm tells us he is a king of majesty a king who is victorious a king who reigns for the sake of truth a king of meekness a king of righteousness and indeed even a divine king your throne O god is forever and ever father as we sing these wonderful truths of our savior and our king jesus we thank you that he is not only the king in the bible story but also the bridegroom in the bible story who came into this world in order to claim his bride and we praise you for what he did in order to win his bride for himself that he laid down his life for her. We thank you for the death of Christ in our place and that through the shed blood of Jesus, we as the church are ransomed and sanctified. We thank you that Christ laid down his life for us in order that we would be cleansed. And in the end, that the church would be presented before him spotless as a perfect bride. And Father, we confess that as things stand in this point of history, the church on earth is not a spotless bride. There are so many things about us that stain us still with the the marks of sin. Father, we know that the, the work of Christ in us is not yet complete because we are not yet made perfect. And so we pray this evening that you would forgive us and cleanse us for all of our sin. Forgive us, Lord, for how we've corrupted your good creation. You alone are are righteous and holy, and in your presence, no one can stand. And so your gracious mercy is our only hope, and we ask for your forgiveness. And we pray for your cleansing touch to wash away our corruption and to clothe us in the righteousness that may only be found by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that even this evening you would wash us with the word, that we would be perfected more and more until at last the work is done and we will be presented before Christ perfect. Lord, do that work amongst us this evening, we pray, for the good of your people and for the glory of Christ, in whose name we ask all of these things. Amen. Well, for our words of encouragement this evening, let me read some verses from Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul, of course, is speaking about marriage, and he, he relates human marriages to that great marriage that dominates the story of the Bible, the marriage of Christ to his people, the church. Paul says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, but no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I will sing together once again as we turn now to hymn number 211 and sing of the love of Christ displayed at the cross where he shed his blood for his bride. O perfect life of love, all, all is finished now. All that he left his throne above to do for us below. Hymn number 211, we'll stand and sing. Please be seated. Let's turn to God's word together as we come to Genesis chapter 2. 
And we read from verse 18 this evening as we continue our series in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed. Now we finish our reading of God's word this evening at the end of Genesis chapter 2. And we thank God for his word to us as ever this evening. Well, we're going to come to God in prayer with our prayers now of thanksgiving and intercession. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for those verses that we've been able to read just a few moments ago. These great verses where marriage is first instituted in the Garden of Eden. And we thank you that it points far beyond Eden itself. These verses point a long history to the culmination of history itself at the return of Christ and the consummation of Christ's marriage to his bride, the church. Father, we thank you for that great love story that is right through the story of the Bible, the love of God shown to us in Christ, and the love of Christ demonstrated in his coming into the world to claim his bride, and the love that was demonstrated when Christ himself went to the cross and laid down his life for his bride, suffering and dying for us there. And we thank you for the ongoing work of Christ amongst us by his Spirit, that even now he is cleansing us by the washing of water by his word. So Father, as we gather this evening as just a small congregation of the Church of Jesus Christ, we pray that you would do that sanctifying work amongst us. We pray that tonight as we listen to your word, that you would cleanse us of our sin. We pray that you would shape us and change us to be the church you've called us to be. We pray that that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ unless, uh, until at last we are made perfect and are with him. And Father, we thank you that in all things you are a sovereign God, even as we heard in your word this morning. You're a God who works all things together in line with your will and for your glory's sake. And we thank you that in all things you are working for the good of the church, your people, shaping and fashioning the church to be the bride that she is meant to be. Father, again, we confess our many shortcomings, but we thank you that Christ is faithful to us nonetheless. And we pray that as the bride of Christ, we would be shaped to be more like the people we are called to be. Father, even as we consider the, the story of the Bible and Christ's marriage to his bride the church we pray for the human marriages represented within this church family and that this evening as we consider the institution of marriage that each marriage within this church would know blessing and renewal and be conformed more and more to the 
pattern for marriage that is laid out in the scriptures. Father, we pray also for marriage in wider society. We know that these are difficult days in which we live, and we pray that the biblical definition of marriage would be restored and upheld for the good of society as a whole, and as well as this, for your glory's sake. Father, we pray as well for our our ministry as a church here. And once again, we pray for the week that lies before us as we prepare for the Holiday Bible Club. Father, we pray that as we gather tomorrow evening and then each subsequent evening this week, uh, that you would bless us with a good attendance of, of children from this area. We pray for those giving the talks that they would know your help and blessing. We pray for your word to go forth and to do so with power and conviction. And we pray, Father, that you would build your people as we engage in in this week of outreach. Father, as well, we do want to pray for our brother Peter. Think of him as he is over in Portugal at the moment. And we pray that as he serves over there, that he would know your blessing and, and help for another week of ministry ahead. And then in due course, a safe return to these shores. And so, Father, we lift before you all of these things. We thank you for your work amongst us. And we pray that your purposes would advance in this place and throughout the world for your glory's sake. Lord, we pray that the bride of Christ, the church, would be built and perfected. All for your glory. And in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. So we'll sing together now. Uh, Hymn number 200, here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. We'll stand and sing together.
Please take a seat. And let's pray together. Father, we pray that in your truth you would now direct us by your Spirit and through your Word. We pray that you would show us Jesus and build up your people in him, all for your glory's sake, because we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. Well, please do have your Bible open there at Genesis chapter 2 and verses 18 through to 25. And we're continuing our series going through these opening chapters of the Bible at the moment. And this evening we come to the institution of the very first marriage that took place in the Garden of Eden. And you don't need me to tell you that we live in a culture today, don't we? where the institution of marriage has been coming under sustained attack, especially in these last few years. And there is so much confusion, so much controversy about how marriage even ought to be defined. And this evening we come to this passage of scripture which is so central to the biblical understanding of marriage. Uh, When Jesus was quizzed about marriage, This is the passage to which he turned to answer those questions. And we get this evening to to come to this passage ourselves and see what God himself has to say about marriage. And we're going to look at marriage from three different angles this evening as we look at these verses. And the first is this, that that marriage has a God-given purpose. A God-given purpose. It's important, isn't it, that you know what something's purpose is. Otherwise, you're going to end up using it in completely the wrong way. And, of course, the the same is true of marriage. If you're going to have a, a marriage that works and that functions properly, you need to know what marriage is actually for. What is the the purpose of marriage. I wonder how you might answer that yourself. And that's really where this passage begins. And verse 18 ought to stick out like a a sore thumb. Because having read the, the opening chapter of the Bible, we've heard how God has created all things and that he has declared all things that he has made to be very good. And then verse 18 of chapter 2 comes as a a shock to us, doesn't it? Because here, for the very first time, something within his creation, God says, is not good. God says it's not good that man should be alone. And the question is, is, what is the problem that God is putting his finger on here? What's not good here? And most people assume that the problem that God is putting his finger on here is the problem of loneliness. So God is is looking down on the Garden of Eden and there's Adam, he's the only human being in existence at this point. And people assume God is saying, poor Adam, he's lonely and that's not good. I'm going to create marriage as the answer to Adam's loneliness. And therefore people assume that the main purpose of marriage, therefore, is that it's God's remedy for loneliness. But I want to argue that that actually there are two big problems with viewing marriage that way. The first, of, of course, is that if you think that marriage is the remedy for loneliness, You can never really be happy if you're single. It's implying something about singleness, isn't it? That it's somehow a lesser station in life where people are always going to be a bit lonely and you'll be forever dissatisfied with life, lacking contentment, unless or until you convince someone to marry you. But the Bible's very clear, isn't it? The singleness itself is a a blessing, a gift from God. 
And so many Christians live fruitful lives, full, happy lives, whilst never being married. But the second problem with thinking that marriage is the remedy for loneliness is that actually you'll never be fully happy if you're married. Because you'll end up with a a warped, self-centred view of marriage, whereby you look at your spouse and you think, this person has to fix my loneliness. It's their job as my spouse to make me happy. It's their job to meet all of my needs. And pretty soon you'll discover that that is an impossible burden for that other person to carry. And so you'll become frustrated because you, you got married thinking, this is the relationship that is going to fix everything for me. And simply by getting married, I would be happy ever after. And so we need to get away from the idea that marriage is first and foremost God's remedy for loneliness. That's its main purpose. Now, of course, marriage does bring wonderful companionship, a great blessing to to those who are married. But if we make that the main purpose of what marriage is about, we will run into difficulties for those reasons I've mentioned. And so the question is, what is the problem that God is putting his finger on there in verse 18? What is not good about Adam being alone? Well, as ever, we need to read that verse in in context. Look at what has happened in the, the previous paragraph, especially verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And as we saw last Sunday evening, Adam was given work to do in the garden. God gave to Adam both a a negative command and a positive command. The negative command was for him not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but the positive command was that he was to work and keep the garden. And then beyond the garden, to go out into the rest of the world and to fill it and subdue it, and exercise dominion over it as a a servant king, a king but serving God, a servant king establishing God's kingdom on the earth, filling the earth, so that in the end the whole world might bring glory to God. And so Adam, you see, has got this huge task ahead of him, a big garden to work and keep, a whole world to fill and form and rule. He's called to serve God in Eden and beyond. And that's the context, you see, in which God then says it is not good that the man should be alone. And so in verse 18, God is not talking about Adam's loneliness. He's talking about Adam's responsibilities. With all of this work to do serving God, Adam is going to need some assistance. And that's why God says, I will make a helper fit for him. If the problem was simply that he was lonely, God would have said, I'll I'll make a friend. I'll make a companion for him. But that's not what God says, is it? God says, no, I will make a helper for him. And you see, that shows us the purpose, the overarching purpose of marriage. God designed marriage So that together, Adam and Eve and their children after them could get busy with the work of serving and obeying their God as they were called to do. Because Adam on his own would not get very far. And as the next few verses describe, Adam looked at all the animals. And amongst the animals, there was not one found that was a suitable helper for Adam in his work. And so God then caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Whilst he he slept, he he took one of his ribs and he he closed up its place with flesh. And then from that rib, the Lord God made a woman, brought it to the man. And when Adam saw Eve, he said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So at last, here is the helper that Adam had been looking for. And together as husband and wife, Adam and Eve, 
could now get busy with the work that God had given them to do. And as they had children, they would be able to raise those children and teach those children what God had commanded so that bit by bit, through multiple children and multiple marriages and multiple generations, God's vision for the world would be fulfilled. Uh, Societies would be formed. Society is made up of the basic building blocks of society, which are marriages and families. And as the human race grew, the kingdom would then stretch out from Eden. The earth would be filled and subdued. Humans would exercise dominion over the earth. And they would do it all to the glory of God. And it would all happen through marriages. And you see, that is the the God-given purpose for marriage. It is so that a man and a wife can serve God alongside one another and do so more effectively and more efficiently and more fruitfully than they could do on their own and raise children who will be able to do that after them. The purpose of marriage is for husband and wife to serve God together better than you can do on your own. And if God so blesses you to raise children who will then serve God after you. And of course, what that looks like in each marriage looks different, depending on the gifts of the couple, uh, the stage of life that they're at, and, and so forth. And yet in their own way, the purpose for every marriage ought to be to serve God together. And if that's the main overarching purpose of marriage, as described in Genesis chapter 2, well, that changes things drastically, doesn't it? changes first of all the way that you view your marriage if you're married because it stops you from looking at your marriage from a a selfish point of view whereby you ask am I getting out of this marriage what I want are my needs being met is my spouse making me happy or not and instead it gives you a God-centered view of marriage whereby you ask are we serving God together as best we can And if you're single, it changes the way that you look for a spouse. Because it it becomes less about thinking, is this person the person who will complete my life so that I can be happy ever after? And instead you start to ask, is this someone with whom I can joyfully serve God? And for all the other wonderful blessings and, and benefits of marriage, first and foremost... Would my service of God be enhanced if I'd be married to this person? So marriage has got a a God-given purpose. And then secondly, there's also a God-given pattern. A God-given pattern. This is where the culture we live in has become so confused, isn't it? With the so-called redefinition of marriage in recent years there's so much confusion about gender about sexuality and so forth we need to listen to what god has to say about the pattern for marriage and here in the opening chapters of of genesis not only does god show us that, that marriage has a particular purpose but marriage also has a particular pattern so what shape should the the marriage relationship take well a number of things need to be said first of all And stating the obvious from what we see here in Genesis 2, marriage is between one man and one woman. This is how God designed it, first of all, in Eden, isn't it? One man, Adam, married to one woman, Eve. And it's the basic pattern for marriage, a monogamous heterosexual relationship. And therefore, so-called same-sex marriage is not marriage in the true sense of the word. And then secondly, notice that there is a complementarity built into the marriage relationship. Complementarity, meaning Adam and Eve are not simply identical, interchangeable components in the relationship. No, they're they're different. Adam, as we've seen, was created first. And as such, he's placed in the position of leadership as the head of the marriage. And Eve created second was designed by God to be helper to Adam. 
And her role is therefore to come under the leadership of Adam in the marriage, uh, submitting to him, helping him as they serve God together. And that's not to say that Eve, for a moment, is inferior in the relationship. I need to put, again, this in the context of, of what's happening in Genesis 1 and 2. The first chapter of the Bible has told us very clearly that both men and women are created in the image of God. And therefore, men and women are, are absolutely equal in terms of their standing before God, their dignity, their worth before God. And yet Genesis chapter 2 tells us that men and women, whilst equal, are also created differently. And as such, they're called to different roles within marriage. And if we're going to handle the, the whole topic of gender correctly, we need to hold together both the equality of the genders and the differences of the genders. So put it like this, if you only think in terms of the differences of the genders and you ignore the fact that the two genders are equal before God, then inevitably you end up with sexist, misogynist views. That's what sexism is, isn't it? It's saying the genders are different and they're not equal. But if you make the opposite mistake and you only think in terms of the equality of the genders and you ignore the fact that there are God-given differences, you end up with the kind of confusion about gender that is so rampant in our society today. That's what our, our culture is saying, isn't it? Whether we're born male or female, there's no real difference. You can be whatever gender you want to be. And I hope you see that the Bible deals with both of those errors. The first two chapters of the Bible tell us the two genders are created equally in terms of their standing before God, but also they're created differently. And therefore, within the context of a marriage relationship, there are different roles for husband and wife to fulfill. The husband called to lead lovingly in the relationship. The wife called to submit to his leadership helpfully. All of which to say, all of which is to say that, that marriage is a complementary relationship. Two different parties, equal but complementing one another by giving their different gifts to the marriage. And then the next thing to say about the pattern for marriage is that it creates a new family unit. So look at verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. When a man gets married, in a sense, he leaves his parents. It's not to say that he just deserts them and forgets about them and, and cuts himself off from them. He's still called to honour his parents, of course. He's still called to care for them. And as the New Testament tells us, especially in their old age, making some return to elderly parents. But it is to say that his primary responsibility now is not to his parents any longer, but now to his wife. Things have changed. The marriage has created a, a new family unit. And so as we read in Genesis 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. And to his wife, the husband is now called to hold fast. That, he, that is, he is to be committed to her, he must be faithful to her. He must forsake all others so long as they both shall live, committing himself fully to this new family unit. And then the final thing to say about the pattern for the marriage relationship is, of course, that it's the God-given context for sexual relations. They shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And notice the emphasis there on the lack of shame. Outside of marriage, sex will always bring with it a sense of shame, a sense of guilt. And for those who live with that shame, the gospel offers cleansing and forgiveness. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthian church, he's speaking to them as a, a gathering of people. And he knows that many of the people in that church had committed grievous sins, including sexual immorality. And he comforts them, doesn't he, with the assurance of the gospel. He says to them, 
but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And for those who have fallen into sexual sin, be assured that in Christ there is cleansing and forgiveness for it. But marriage is the God-given context for sexual relations to take place without any shame. And so marriage, as we see in these few verses from Genesis chapter 2, has a God-given pattern. Just in these few verses, we see that God has established the pattern for marriage. It is monogamous, it is heterosexual, it is a complementary relationship. It creates a new family unit and it's the God-given context for sexual relations. This is the pattern for marriage. And then there's one final thing I want us to think about before we close this evening. And that is that marriage is a God-given picture. So it has a a God-given purpose. It it has a God-given pattern, but also it's a God-given picture. Because when God created marriage in the Garden of Eden, he was deliberately giving to us a a picture of something else. Marriage points beyond itself to something even greater. Because as we mentioned already this evening, marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. And each human marriage, therefore, is to be like a little picture of the gospel. The relationship between the husband and the wife somehow reflecting the relationship of Christ with his bride, the church. Now it has to be said, not every marriage reflects that very well. And yet, be that as it may, marriage is this God-given picture. And so think of what happens here in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God takes his son, Adam, and he puts him into a deep sleep. And then he performs a strange kind of of surgery upon Adam. He opens up his side, he takes out a rib, and from that rib he, he then creates a bride for his son. And he gives the bride to his son Adam. And by so doing, as Adam and Eve give themselves to the work of serving God, they would be able to go and fulfill God's purposes on the earth. And it's all a picture, you see, of what God has done ultimately in Christ. When Jesus died, as it were, the Lord God put his son Jesus into a deep sleep. And shortly after Jesus had fallen into that deep sleep of death, his side was then pierced. And yet by virtue of Christ's wounds a bride was created for him and God has given that bride the church to Christ the church as the bride of Christ is now bound to him in in loving covenant relationship marriage a covenant relationship towards which Christ will always be faithful and in that relationship Christ is the head the church submits to his leadership And the church's calling is to serve God underneath the leadership of Christ so that God's purposes in the world will be fulfilled. And you see, marriage is a God-given picture of the relationship that exists between Christ and his bride, the church. And that's what the Apostle Paul brings out in that beautiful passage in Ephesians chapter 5. As he, he teaches the church there about what their marriages should look like. He says to them, you need to model your marriage on the gospel. He speaks to the wives first of all, and he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Then he turns to the husbands and he he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, 
so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Do you want your marriage to be everything that it could possibly be? Well, understand that marriage is a God-given picture of the gospel. And so if you get your head around the gospel, you will get your head around your marriage as well. And yet if you don't get your head around the gospel, you'll never truly get your head around your marriage either. And if you're a wife, see how the church is called to give herself submissively to the leadership of Christ, serving under his leadership. And in a similar way, devote yourself to the leadership of your husband. Serve alongside him as his helper. And then husbands, look at how Christ has loved the church, how he gave himself for her, sacrificially, unconditionally, graciously, in order that she might be made new in his love. And then having looked at how Christ has loved the church, Lead your marriage like that, giving yourself for your wife. Laying your life down for her. Loving her in a sacrificial, unconditional, gracious way. Leading her lovingly so that she might be renewed day by day in your love towards her. And if you do that, husbands and wives, then your marriage will be everything that it can be will be a God-given picture of the love of Christ for his bride, the church, and her love for him in return. This is the God-given picture that God has given to us by giving us the institution of marriage. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, once again, we do thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the gift of marriage and for all that it means and for all of the many blessings that it brings and we pray that you would write your word upon our hearts this evening so that whether single or married our view of marriage might come more fully in line with your word we do pray for all the marriages represented here this evening we pray that the goal of each marriage would be to bring glory to your name as husband and wife serve you together. And not only serve you together, but serve you better than they could do on their own. Father, we pray as well for those who are not married. And we ask that if it be your will, that in due time you would provide a godly spouse for each, that they might together serve you. Father, we pray that our marriages would be shaped by the the pattern of your word as laid out in Genesis chapter 2. We know that we live in a world where that pattern has been disregarded and distorted and rejected. And yet may we stand up for what the Bible says about marriage and may our own marriages fully reflect that pattern that you have established for us. And as such, may each marriage then provide a picture A glorious, beautiful picture of Christ's love for the church and her love for him in return. Even as the Apostle Paul has written, this mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And may that be the case for each marriage represented here so that through our marriages we bring glory to you because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a closing hymn now, which is number 313. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Hymn number 313, we'll stand and sing.
from him he came and sought him to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Elect from every if you're involved in the holiday bible club please do hang around afterwards for just a brief time in the the room there but as we close this service uh, remain standing and receive these words of benediction may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen